yeah so i just started recording i'll see how that goes um but with that being said it, it is one o'clock so i'll just go ahead and get started um my name's eric i'm now a fourth year uh econ major also studying stats uh as like a minor but i really enjoy this class because it's it has like this reputation of being pretty hard but i think that if you can master like a very limited amount of topics um it becomes a lot easier to kind of work through the class. So what I always tell people is that if you can kind of get the basics down, then a lot of the harder material becomes a lot easy, uh, easier, I guess, just because you have that reference point uh, on how to do it. Um, so as I said, my name's Eric. Um, these are going to be the scheduled Zoom hours. Um, I believe it's once a week. I know that summer is twice a week. Um, so you guys should be here Mondays, uh, and then I'll have another group on Wednesdays uh, where I'll typically just cover the same material. So if you go to Monday, that's the same as going to Wednesday. Uh, so no need to go to both. Uh, I do have drop-in hours, which you can probably find on the Gaucho space. Um, but off the top of my head, it's Monday, Wednesdays from 2 to 2.50, um, and drop-in start on Wednesday, uh, as well as... I believe it's Tuesdays from 1 to 1.50, but I could be wrong on that. Um, so you guys just probably want to double check that um, on, your own, uh, on your own time. Um, so what I want to say about CLAS is that, you know, we're all student teachers for the most part. Um, there may be instances in which I say something that contradicts what your professor says. And so whenever that's the case, you should always just relegate to what the professor said. Um, you know, obviously ask me to clarify. It's possible that I just misspoke. Um, but yeah, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, what else? Um, if you guys ever have any questions about advice for taking this class, um, I know that for a lot of you, you take this as a transfer, uh, especially in the fall. And so you guys are pretty nervous about like the, I believe it's a B requirement that you guys need in order to make it into the major. And so you guys kind of bring a lot of, um, in my opinion, unnecessary stress onto yourselves. You like start to fret. Um, you know, I think that through preparation, a lot of the stress gets removed. So if you guys haven't really checked out your gaucho space yet, um, there's like a million practice tests that are on there that I think are the best resource for taking the class. So, um, you know, there's midterm ones, midterm twos, there's even some midterm threes. Um, and basically what you see on those practice tests are what you'll see on the real test, just kind of with numbers mixed around. So um, there really shouldn't be any surprise about what um, shows up on, on your test. So just kind of be familiar with, you know, that, that resource that you have, um, as well as um, some of my other peers. So. Uh, there's three 10A tutors, I believe. I typically don't post worksheets just because I think that the practice tests are enough. But if you go into their Gaucho Space tabs um, under like the general 10A class, um, it's possible that they'll post tests or like practice problems. Um, but as I said, you know, you should have a ton of resources. Um, so in addition to the practice tests, there's like the uh, homework reviews, there's like the extra problem sets, the problem sets. All that. So all this to say is that you guys should be well prepared um, in terms of material you have to study. So with that being said, I think that um, as I mentioned before, and this was kind of before class started, this will be a quicker class. I know that you've probably only had what two two lectures so far, um, and so there really isn't a ton of material to cover. Um, but I would what I'll generally say about this class is that. A lot of what you'll be doing is maximizing what we call utility, right? So you can think of utility as um, like general happiness, um, your contentness with something, just pleasure. Um, but generally, we think of having a higher utility as being better, right? Um, and so the point of this class is maximizing our utility given the resources that we have, right? So obviously, um, I would love to live in a mansion with like 30 really nice cars, 
on the beach, right? But there's a restriction based on like the income that I have, right? And so you guys have been introduced to this concept of the budget constraint. The budget constraint is what limits, right? What we can actually consume, right? So you'll notice that in that original statement that I, that I said before, where we have our preferences and we have our like budget, our preferences are kind of unlimited, right? Preferences don't have a, any boundaries. It just kind of is what it is, but it's the, it's the budget that kind of restricts what our preferences can ultimately become, right? So keep that in mind. Um, eventually, we're gonna kind of bring those two concepts together, um, but for now, just kind of focus on the budget constraint part of it, um, which as I mentioned is what is gonna limit us. So if you think about our budget constraint, and you think about consuming two different goods. Also, can you guys see that all right? Is it dark enough? Just give me like a thumbs up or something. I know that this is like not ideal just because I don't have an iPad or anything where you can, yeah, a little faint. I'll see if I can maybe use a darker marker. But I wish I had an iPad where I could basically just screen share, but um, I'm stuck with this whiteboard. Yeah, I think that should be better. Um, so we think about our consumption choices between two goods, which we're gonna eventually consider that our bundle. So a bundle is gonna be some combination of X1 and X2, right? That we're eventually going to utilize in order to um, produce some sort of output that we're gonna consider a utility, right? So you'll see this in the class this U with X1 and X2 next to this. And this is basically just like a mathematical way of saying our utility as a function of X1 and X2, where X1 and X2 are just two different inputs, right? That are gonna go into our utility function, right? Where our utility could look something like X1 plus X2, for example. And that's, that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but pretty much what I'm trying to say is that this class is basically just gonna be making decisions between two different goods where we have to make trade-offs, right? You probably heard this term before. We have to make trade-offs between those two goods in order to reach like an optimal amount of each good, right? Or optimal based on what we can afford, all right? So when we think about this budget constraint, we're gonna have our X1 axis right here and our X2 axis right here, mm-hmm. And um, when we're talking about our budget constraints, we're gonna wanna be familiar with different notation uh, that goes along with it. So you'll typically see this equation written down, P1 times X1 plus P2 times X2 equals M, where P1 is price of X1, X1 is just good one. And you guys can kind of figure out the rest, right, in terms of P2 and X2. Um, and M is gonna be our total income, right? And so we make the assumption that we're gonna be, able, we're gonna be spending as much as we have to, to spend, right? Uh, which is pretty much just to say that we're gonna be utilizing all of the money that we have. We're not gonna be saving it uh, for any future consumption. Um, in, in kind of weeks to follow, you will see a situation in which maybe you don't spend all of your money at once and you save some. Um, but for now, we're going to make the assumption that you have one opportunity to spend everything you have. And so that's why we're going to say that this combination of X1 and X2 is going to be equal to the amount of money that we have, right? And if you kind of think about what this equation writes or reads as, um, it becomes a lot more intuitive. I would definitely recommend just for any equation that you're, you're given is just reading it out and seeing kind of how you can make sense of it. So basically what this is, is just the price of the first good that you're consuming times the number of goods that you are going to have plus the price of the second good times the amount of the second good. And so intuitively, right, that's like, um, that's going to equal to some number, right? that we're gonna say is equal to this M value right here, 
right? And so when we're dealing with a situation like this, and we're being asked to graph this on just an X1, X2 plane, um, the first thing that I always like to do is finding what my axes are, right? I think that once you can find your axes, it becomes a lot easier to, to complete the rest. So if I'm looking at how much of X1 I can possibly afford to consume, well, if I'm on this axis, what does that tell me about the level of X2 that I have, right? Um, and so I want you guys to kind of think about this. Um, you know, ideally, if this was a classroom, I would ask you guys, but um, over Zoom, where a lot of you guys, if we're being honest, don't really want to participate, and you know, I can't blame you. I wouldn't want to either. Um, I'm not just for like the sake of dead silence. Um, but I want you guys to kind of think about what it means to be on the axes, right? When you're on the axes, you're basically maximizing the amount of X1 that you can have, while also making the assumption that our X2 is gonna be set to zero, right? And so when X2 is set to zero, if you think about what this equation is, right? So we have P1 X1 plus P2 X2 equals M. If X2 is zero, this whole term is reduced. And if I'm solving for X1, all I really need to do is just divide both sides by P1, right? So X1 becomes M over P1, which is pretty much just the amount of income that we have divided by the price of the good that we're trying to find, right? So this point right here is M over P1, right? And you guys can kind of apply that same logic to X2, where um, if we're on this axis right here, right? And that's not really clear, it's not dark. If we're on this axis right here, that's essentially just telling us that we're consuming zero units of X2, or X1, I should, I should say, and that we can set our X1 equal to zero, cancel this out, and just divide both sides by P2, right? And so in this scenario, we have M over P2, right? And if you notice um, what this graph is, right, there's a very linear relationship between X1 and X2, right? Um, which is gonna tell us that there's gonna be a straight line connection. And let me try to make sure that's dark enough for you guys. Yeah. So basically this is gonna be a straight line that's gonna connect our two axes. And this is what our budget constraint's gonna be. It's essentially, right, the trade-off you're making between X1 and X2 in which you're still spending the same amount of money, right? So if you think about kind of what that statement means, every point along this curve, right, or this line, if you will, is gonna cost us the same amount of income, right? All of these points are gonna make it so that the total, right, combination of X1 and X2 is gonna equal to our M, right, our, our income. And so that's something that's really kind of gonna be key is that keeping our income con constant is how we can make a trade-off between X1 and X2 while still being affordable, right? And so basically what this relationship is, is P1 over P2, right? Where we're gonna have to make an exchange based on the prices, right, that each good is, right? So this slope right here is going to be P1 over P2. Um, it's technically negative P1 over P2. Um, but just for kind of formality, you include this negative sign. Um, and so to answer your question, Dominic, um, anything outside of the budget constraint would be unaffordable, right? So um, if you kind of just wanna mark each of these, so just for graphing purposes, anything that's along here in this blue part is gonna be a combination of X1 or X2 that is more than the income that we have. Whereas anything that is within this green segment is going to be um, affordable, right? But it's not gonna equal up to the amount of income that we have. And if you remember, we wanna use all of the income that we have. And so you would never wanna be anywhere here, right? And it's impossible to be anywhere here, right? So ideally you wanna be somewhere along on this curve where it's exactly equal to M. Um, and so to answer your, uh, your question, Aaron, 
Um, you do want to, well, I think that when you talk about leaving it negative or not leaving it negative, you just want to be consistent throughout the problem. So you'll see that we, we get to this point where um, we are going to set it equal to what we're going to call our MRS. I wouldn't worry about that too much. But basically, you just want to make sure that your signs are consistent where um, you don't have a negative on one side, but you don't have it on, on the other, right? Um, you just want to make sure that the negatives are being consistent. And it'll probably make sense later on when we talk about the concept of our marginal rate of substitution. Um, but for now, I think that I would just leave it negative because it makes the most sense just based on the negative slope. So um, I guess that was kind of a long answer to it. And so that point in the middle, is that the equilibrium point? Um, there is no equilibrium point. So this is simply just what's affordable, right, along the curve. Um, if you think about an equilibrium point, that would indicate that we're, we're um, taking into account preferences, which is something that we haven't introduced yet. So when we get to preferences, we'll see that there's going to be a best point along this curve, right, that is um, going to be the equilibrium, if you will. But that's a, that's a good question. Um, so kind of be familiar with this, uh, this graph uh, in particular. Um, this is something that's super important and is going to carry on throughout uh, all 10 weeks of the quarter. Um, and also be familiar with how certain uh, changes in our inputs are going to change our curve, right? So think about what happens when um, we get changes in prices, right? So say that we have, uh, let me try to make this as dark as I can. Let me use a different marker. So going back to this original curve right here, um, think about kind of what happens when we get changes in our inputs, right? So that could be changes in our prices or changes in our income, right? So what happens when our income kind of expands out? Well, if you notice, this, this axis right here is M over P2, and this is M over P1, which tells us that income right affects both axes equally right so if we get an increase in our income so say income goes up well then this axis is also going to expand out right and this axis is also going to expand out and so what's going to happen is because we still have that linear connection between our two axes right we're going to get something that is basically just going to be a shift outwards like that and you guys can kind of imagine what happens when M goes down, right? Um, we get a, a shift like this. Um, so be familiar with kind of the inputs that go along. So just kind of adding to that, think about what happens when we get changes in prices, right? So a change in P1 is gonna look different than a change uh, in P2, for example. So we have this right here. And say that our P1, say that our price of good one uh, increases. So when this happens, right, because this axis contains P1 in the equation, right, or in the expression, if you will, then you're basically dividing the same value of M by a greater value of P1. And so this is going to shift it inwards like this, where we get a pivot on this point. And notice that this doesn't contain any P1. So this axis is actually not affected at all by a change in price, whereas this axis is affected. Um, and you'll notice that a very opposite reaction is going to occur when the price of good one goes down. We're instead going to get a shift outwards like that, right? Um, and same for P2, right? Um, so notice how uh, a change in income is going to cause this whole curve to shift, but a change in the price is only going to cause it to pivot right along that point. So that's something that you got to be familiar with. Um, and I think that when you have it totally labeled, that takes care of a lot of issues. Um, so just kind of be aware of that, right? Be aware of the certain variables that you have um, and where they belong, right, in respect to the graph and how it affects it, obviously. So that's like my biggest piece of advice. 
um, when it comes to shifts in your budget constraint. Uh, now, let's kind of go into a little bit more nuanced concepts. So stuff like sales tax, stuff like coupons, uh, and stuff like tiered pricing. So these are all things that you probably, I would think you've seen already in lecture. Uh, and if you haven't, you definitely will see soon. Um, so there's a sec. So let's go into the idea of sales tax. So sales tax, you can kind of think of as like price tiering where you get different goods, right? Um, and it's kind of like a price increase, if you will, right? So when you have a sales tax, so sales tax right here, um, say that we have a 20% tax on X2, um, essentially what this is, is it's pretty much just um, increasing the price of good two by 20%, right? Um, and so at the heart of the issue, this is really just an increase in the price of good two by 20% or like by a factor of 1.2, right? And so what's gonna happen is, um, if you kind of remember what we've been doing, right? Um, with changes in price, you'll, you'll want to notice that P2 only affects, right, this point right here, but it doesn't affect this point at all, right? And so if we want to give numbers to this question, so say that M is equal to 60, P1 is equal to 5, and P2 is equal to 10, well, now all of a sudden, the price of good two is effectively just $12 right? And so we go from being able to afford six units of good two, right? Which is what happens when we don't spend any money on good one. We go from being able to afford six units of good two to only being able to afford five units of good two, right? And if you think about good one, nothing changes, right? There's no change in price of good one. And so, um, Basically, you're going to get something that looks like this, where we get that pivot that we were talking about. And so you go from, here, this is kind of light. We go from six right here to five right here, right? And essentially what this is, is I've kind of mentioned it, but this is basically just, um, yeah, Devin. So the change in price causes a pivot. Um, what this is right here is basically just like the application of a change in price where um, if you think about like a word problem, all, all word problems really are just kind of uh, adding like a context behind a very simple concept. Um, what about change in amount of goods? So the change in amount of goods is, um, is gonna be a byproduct of the change in price, right? Obviously, if the price changes, but your income doesn't change, that's gonna affect how much of each good we're gonna be able to afford. So in a way, right, it does lead to a change in uh, quantity demanded or quantity uh, that you can afford, but it's not like a direct change, right? The direct change is the change in price, which ultimately leads to that. Um, so it's kind of like a step-by-step -step process. Um, so this is basically just a sales tax. Um, it's a pretty straightforward concept. It really is at the heart of it, just a change in price. Um, so I don't, I don't think you guys should worry about this too much. Um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Now let's look at, and this is 12, just to add that. Um, I think that stuff like coupons and tiered pricing are, are things that are going to be maybe a little bit more complex um, that could cause you guys maybe some issues. And so we're, we're going to talk about that right now. So um, if you guys have ever used coupons at, say, the grocery store or um, I'm trying to think where else, you, I guess fast food places take coupons. Um, I guess a lot of places take coupons, right? Um, but you've probably used a coupon once or twice in your life, right? Um, and so you know that coupons, depending on what the deal is, right, uh, can have very different effects. Um, so we're going to make the assumption that 
we're essentially going to be given these coupons that allow you to uh, purchase an object for free, right? And so let's say that we have a situation where, um, so coupons, let's say that we have a situation where um, you are given eight coupons for one free unit of X1, right? And so when you think about what that kind of means in this context, and let me just erase this because I'm eventually gonna need to use this space. But basically when you're given something for free, right? That doesn't change any of, right? The prices or the income, right? But it does affect how much uh, of the quantity that you can afford, right? Because obviously if something's for free, um, then it just, it kind of adds on to what we're already previously able to afford, right? So if I'm given eight coupons for one free unit of X1, um, we're noticed that if we still spend all our money on good one, we're gonna be able to afford these 12 units. But in addition to that, right, we get eight units on top of that. And so um, what we're gonna be given, right, is 12 plus eight is equal to 20. Now that in itself is not complicated at all, in my opinion, um, but what can kind of confuse students or I wouldn't say confused, but what kind of slips the mind of some students is that you may be tempted to connect this point now to this point right here, right? And that is something that is something, you know, you would easily think to do, right? And not really think twice about, but would you really want to be connecting this point to right here, right? Um, if you think about what this slope is, right, just as a refresher, this slope right here is negative P1 over P2, right? Did any of our prices change in this case, right? Um, the answer is no, right? There was no price change or anything like that. And so the slope should stay the same. But if I'm connecting this point to this point, well, that's a slope change, right? The slope is gonna, is gonna decrease. So you wanna maintain the same slope, right? And so the, re the way that you can do this is now we got to think about how many units of good two, right, that we're going to be able to buy um, at the maximum. So because there's no change in price, we're still going to be able to buy six units of good two, right? However, when we're buying those six units of good two, right, all our money is going towards good two. However, because we get eight free units of good one, you also want to factor that in to our, our graph. Right, and so we get this point eight, and uh, I'm trying to make it so that it doesn't doesn't kind of mess things up too much. Can you guys see this green point right there? Hopefully, it's not too blurry or not too light. Um, but essentially, what this point is is you're spending all your money on good two still, but because of these coupons, you're still going to be able to afford um, units of good one. And so you're going to see that it shifts, it shifts out like that. And so we're going to maintain, and obviously this is not drawn to scale, but we're going to maintain the same slope that we had previously, right? So these two should be parallel lines um, where this is now our new budget constraint right here. Um, are there any questions about that? I know that with a sales tax, it's pretty straightforward, but with um, coupons, it can be a little bit more confusing. Um, I think that you always want to keep in mind that you can basically tack on eight units of good one to whatever bundle you previously had, right? So, um, if you think about what this point is right here, this point would have been six and three, um, right? So this midpoint right here is six and three, right? Um, now basically what this point is, is six and, um, or it's 14 and three, right? We're basically just adding eight units of good one to um, wherever we are along this curve, right? So you can kind of think about shifting it by eight units to the right. Does that make sense? Um, hopefully it does. Um, but if there are questions, feel free to leave it uh, in the chat. Um, and so to answer your question, Ryan, once we know preferences, um, 
can we use our original graph but then add eight units of good one? Um, so uh, preferences don't really come into play in that context. Um, what you really want to focus on is this budget constraint just in general. And then from there, we can evaluate where our preferences lie. But you always want to make sure that you, um, how did I know that it was three? Um, well, because just the slope is one half. So you would always have um, twice as many units of good one as good two. Um, but that was kind of just also looking at if I have six units of good one, I can only afford three units of good two. Um, kind of like that. I mean, it, was, it wasn't necessarily meant to be super important, but all of this to say is that you pretty much just add eight units of good one to wherever you are along this curve right here, okay? Um, so that's kind of it for coupons. Um, I do think that they're super important, um, especially early on in the class. Um, there is a situation in which you can sell coupons. Um, and so when you sell coupons, what that uh, allows you to do is basically just um, increase your income. And so um, you'll see that um, your income is going to increase, which is really just going to allow you to shift out your budget constraint in a similar way that you did here. Um, but uh, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of be able to play with it, right? So um, say that you can, actually, let's, since we do have time, let's say that we can sell coupons for $5 each, right? And so now let's just make the assumption that we sell all of these at once. That's going to increase our income by $40, right? And so now we have $100 right here. Um, ignore that the prices are still 10. Um, so we now have $100 to work with. And so this is not going to affect anything for uh, good one. Notice how we still were able to afford 20, right? Which is the same as what we're able to afford now. However, um, in the previous example, we weren't allowed to go over more than uh, six units of good two, simply because we were capped at that amount. But because we were able to sell our coupons, now we're able to um, afford two more units, right, of good two than we previously were, right? So now we're at this point where it's eight over here, right? Where because our income is part of our axes, right? Now this becomes 100 over 10. Um, actually, this is, that was just bad math. This is just 10 now. Um, so now you notice how, whereas we were capped here, we couldn't go past this six, uh, six unit level. We're now able to kind of push, push through uh, and afford more than six units uh, of good two. Um, and so that's kind of just the benefit of being able to sell the coupons is that now we can kind of allocate that money towards either good, whereas not being able to sell the coupons, we could only um, use that towards uh, consuming good one. Um, so hopefully you guys can kind of see that um, and that makes sense. But I think it all comes down towards also just being familiar with these axis points. Uh, I know that I've been saying it a lot, um, but you really do want to make sure that you're understanding how increasing your income is going to increase these different points uh, on our curve. So I think that's it for coupons. I'm going to go into tiered pricing. Okay. Twelve. This is M over P1, and this is six, and we have it connected like, oh, shoot, that's bad. Have it connected like this, right? And so um, let's 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 think of a scenario in which, um, so tiered pricing. 
So let's think of a scenario in which the first four units of x1 are five dollars a unit, but that um, any any units after four are ten dollars a unit. And so what I like to do when we have these scenarios of tiered pricing is think about the point in which um, our prices change. So I like to not only think about our axis points, but also this four units of good one where we're experiencing that price change, right? Um, because that, that, that's gonna tell us a lot about uh, what our graph is gonna ultimately come out to be. So let's think of a scenario, right? in which, and I'm just gonna erase this just for now. Um, let's think of a scenario, so scenarios, in which we buy only X1, right? So in this case, oh, uh, is it that blurry? Sorry. Um, hopefully that makes it better. Um, this is really just, this is just the axis point right here. This is our X2 axes. This is our X1 axes. Does that make it better? Hopefully it does. Um, but I'm just gonna keep going. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, all right, awesome. So um, we wanna look at our different scenarios, right? So basically when I'm buying only X1, that's just finding my X1 axes. Um, sorry, man, I live in IV. There's like no, this, it's bad lighting. Um, I'll try, I'll try in the future. I could maybe work in my backyard next time. Um, so in this scenario, scenario one, where I'm buying only X1, you wanna kind of think about how many I'm able to afford, right? So if I'm buying the first four units for $5, right? Then, so four units equals $20. I now have $40 to spend, right? Still on X1. But now the price of X1 is now $10 a unit. So I have $40 divided by $10 is equal to four units, right? So I'm able to buy those first four units for 20, but then those next four, I can only buy for 40, right? And so if I think about what my axis point is gonna be, right, this is now gonna be at eight, right? Um, and notice that there's no change, there's nothing mentioned here about uh, the price of good two. And so this is gonna stay the same, where we have uh, six units of good two, if I buy only good two, right? So buy only X2, right? Um, there's nothing tiered about it. So I have $60 to allocate between $10 a unit which is just gonna be six units, right? So there's nothing complicated about scenario two. Um, scenario three is where it gets a little bit complicated, right? So um, kind of what I've mentioned before is that this is always gonna be a linear connection. Um, there's a caveat to that in which we have tiered pricing, right? You may be tempted to kind of just make this, this straight line connection, um, but I'm urging you guys to, when you see this kind of scenario, always evaluate the point at which the price changes. So you want to see what it looks like when I'm buying four units of good one, and then the rest of it goes towards good two, right? So um, I guess in math, it's called like the point of inflection. Um, but this is essentially kind of what you want to be thinking of, right? So in this third scenario, you buy four of X1, right? And so when you buy these units of X1, that's gonna equal $20, right? And I'll move the, I'll point it downwards actually. So this is gonna be equal to $20. And so I now have $40 to now spend money on good two, which um, good two is still $10. So 40 over 10 is equal to four, right? So if I graph this out, this would be around, so this is two, four, six, right? I now have a point that's right here 
at four comma four, right? Because when I buy four units of good one, I'm also able to buy four units of good two. And so um, what you see is that instead of a straight line that maybe would look like this, I now have to connect these two dots, or I guess these three dots, right? Um, so that it doesn't look like a straight line between the axes, right? Instead, it's gonna look something like this, and then like this, right? Um, where they are still straight lines between the two points, um, but there's this little kink, right? Uh, if you notice that. So um, that's like the biggest thing about tiered pricing is just kind of the way that it looks, right? With respect to the rest of the budget constraints problems um, where we're not gonna have uh, a straight line between the axes in most cases, um, you're typically, you'll typically see this kink, right? Um, and so that's kind of it for the budget constraints. Um, next, next week, we're definitely going to talk more about preferences and uh, indifference curves, which hopefully you kind of, oh, I guess I maybe I shouldn't have erased so fast. But um, next week, we're going to talk about preferences, right? And then... Um, I guess in week three is when we kind of all put it together and we make this sort of connection between the two um, so that we can kind of maximize our utility based on our prefer or based on our uh, budget, which is kind of that first bullet point that I mentioned uh, right at the beginning of lecture. Um, you'll, you'll see some stuff about preferences. Yeah, so the Wednesday one is gonna be the exact same. Um, it's not really fair to cover like different material um, for different classes. So I, I just keep it the same. Um, there are some things that I can talk about. Um, so you may have heard these terms. Will it be like that here on out? What do you mean like that? Like, like what? Um, I believe, yeah, it's only supposed to be are you guys enrolled on Monday and Wednesday? No. Yeah, we should be. What the fuck? It says Monday, Wednesday is the time. Uh, I'm used to, here, let me just check in with my like supervisor about that. Um, I know that cool. you're learning new cool, yeah, topics, thanks. but this is supposed to kind of just cover the week just as a whole. Um, how about you guys come on Wednesday and I'll see I'll see what I can do. Just or maybe I'll just send a like a notification on the Gaucho space if you guys are enrolled. Um, but typically the way it, it has been is that during 10 week quarters, we just have 10 meetings total where I cover basically the week's worth of, of subject material. Um, for like the whole week. So uh, I'll check in with my supervisor about that. Uh, and then I'll make an announcement on uh, the Gaucho Space page. Um, but for now, I guess if you guys are enrolled, certainly do feel free to come on Wednesday. Um, and if you find that it's kind of redundant, or yeah, if you find that it's redundant, then, um, you know, you guys aren't, you guys aren't mandated, like, it's not mandatory for you guys to be here. So uh, you guys can kind of just do as you will. Um, but there is like a slight bit of material that I want to just close the class out on. Uh, it's not something that I find to be super uh, pertinent to the class, but um, it's something that I have seen on a lot of multiple choice questions. Um, and it seems like with the, with the class being online, there's only multiple choice, right? So uh, typically we had like FRQs, but that I think is eliminated. So you'll see a lot of these where they kind of just throw uh, like definition questions at you. Um, and so it's important to know the definitions, um, but like, you know, this is also something that because of the class is open note, it's not that important to have memorized. So I want to talk about just the terms completeness, completeness, uh, reflexivity, and transitivity. 
and kind of what they mean um, without getting too far into it. So um, the definition of completeness is that any two bundles can be compared. Um, what this means, and so you'll typically see it like X1, X2, um, this squiggly line is basically they're indifferent between the two, um, Y1, Y2. And so what this means is that bundle one um, is, or I guess bundle X is indifferent to bundle Y where uh, a consumer kind of views these as being equal, right? And so basically the three options are bundle X is greater than bundle Y, bundle one is indifferent to bundle Y, and bundle X is less than bundle Y. So that's kind of what complete this means is that you can make a comparison between two bundles, right? Uh, and typically when you make a comparison between bundles, you're making a comparison between the utility that the bundles produce, right? Uh, and so that, that's what completeness means. Um, reflexivity, I think this is probably the dumbest one. I don't, I hate to say that it's not dumb, but it's more of like a very complex, like beyond me kind of like math interpretation where it's basically saying that um, a bundle, and this is kind of the definition that you'll find, a bundle is at least as good as itself Right, and if that doesn't make sense to you, don't feel bad. It doesn't really make sense to me, um, but it's essentially just saying that. Um, I'm not even sure what it's trying to say. It's it's basically just saying that if you have two equivalent bundles, right, the bundle that is equivalent to the other, right, is basically just it's either comparable, right, which makes the most sense, or it's slightly better. I wouldn't look too much into like this interpretation. Um, this is easily something that if you see it on a test is basically just gonna be a definition. And so that's really what you need to know. Uh, transitivity actually makes the most sense. So say we have bundle A and A is better than B, B is better than C, right? By transitivity, A is better than C. This is actually something that you've probably seen in a lot of different classes. So um, transitivity, I think you'll see the most just because it actually is the most intuitive, right? Um, based on these relationships. Um, but yeah, these are kind of just terms that be familiar with the fact that they exist, but you don't need to memorize them too much, especially with um, having the class be open to. Um, and so one last thing that I kind of just popped into my mind, um, because the tests are open note, I definitely th would recommend doing those practice tests and then just having those right in front of you um, where you, you can kind of just look for a problem that's similar to what's on your test uh, that you've done and just work it out in a very similar way. Um, so that's kind of all I'll say. I know that um, it actually is almost 150. I wasn't planning on going this long, but um, with Zoom, it's always just a little bit weirder. Um, so thanks for bearing with me. Uh, as for Wednesday, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work. Uh, I'm probably just going to text my supervisor right now uh, and then release something over, um, over Gaucho Space. Yeah. Um, so I, I always go over like certain problems from the, um, from the practice tests, um, but I won't go over like a whole practice test in most cases. Um, unless, of course, you guys want me to. I mean... If it turns out that we have two, two lectures a week, um, I may be able to kind of just uh, maybe do one, one lecture on like the conceptual stuff and then do the second lecture. It's basically just practice problems. Um, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, yeah, um, all, yeah, I, I don't want to go too much longer, but basically any like further announcement will be um, will be uh, posted on the Gaucho space. Uh, past worksheets, you should find stuff. We have like a, a website. If you look up Econ 10A like website, there should be stuff. It's like weebly.com or something. I definitely didn't make it. It existed a lot more, uh, a lot. It existed before I became a tutor, but uh, I've definitely gotten some material from there. So uh, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, and so with that being said, I don't want to take up any more of your time. 
So thanks for showing up, guys. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll stay behind for a little bit um, and answer any questions, but uh, you guys are free to go. Oh, my God. Pause. Oops.